All right, so now we're moving on to calculus with vector-valued functions. And of course, if we're going to do calculus, first thing you should talk about is limits. Is that, of course, I don't know. Do we need to start with limits? Seems to be the place that we start. Maybe we don't have to start with limits, but let's start there anyway. Okay, so we want to say, well, what would it mean So what does it mean to say, or write, uh, you know, um, the, let's say the limit as t approaches t naught of some vector valued function r of t is some limiting vector value l. Right? What does it mean? Well, um, I guess one thing you can do is you can kind of, you know, you could take sort of the, the precise definition approach and you could say, well, this means for every epsilon bigger than zero, there is some uh, delta bigger than zero such that um, if the absolute value of t minus t naught is less than delta, that implies that the magnitude r of t minus l, and here's another great thing about working with vectors, right? We can talk about the difference of two vectors. It makes sense. We can talk about the magnitude, right? Uh, we need to take the magnitude because we want to compare to this real number epsilon. So we need to think about the length, right? So the length of the difference, right? That's a measure of how close together the two vectors are, right? So what is this saying in kind of more imprecise language, right? What it's saying is that, you know, we can make our vector valued function r of t, we can make it as close as we want to L in the sense of give me any measure of closeness that you want, right? Um, that's what the epsilon represents. How close together do you want them, right? And no matter how close together you want them, you can find a t value sufficiently close to this reference point t naught um, so that when t is close enough to t naught, r of t will be that measure of closeness that you're looking for from L, right? You can make it as close to L as you want. Um, that's sort of the imprecise way of noticing it, okay? Um, now, one thing that we can, we can do with this is, you know, let's say that R of t is some, so let's say it's F1 of t, F2 of t, and L of t is equal to, let's say, just L1, L2. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that the absolute value of, let's say, F1 of t minus L, okay, well, that's equal to the square root of f1 of t minus l, sorry, l1 squared. And that is less than or equal to the square root of f1 of t minus l1 squared plus f2 of t minus l2 squared, right? And this is the magnitude of r of t uh, minus l, right? Um, so if we can make this difference less than epsilon, we can also make this difference less than epsilon. Um, and then, of course, the same would go for the magnitude of f2 uh, minus l2, right? Um, and so, if the, if the limit of this vector-valued function, r of t, is the vector l, well, 
then it has to also follow that the limit of f1 has to equal l1, and the limit of f2 has to equal l2. Okay? Um, and with a little bit more work, uh, you can turn it around and go the other way and say, well, if the limit of f1 is equal to l1, and the limit of f2 is equal to l2, uh, then you can show that the limit of r of t is equal to l. Right? Um, and so you get, a, you get a theorem, right? And the theorem basically says that the, and again, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit lazy about how I write the theorem, just in the interest of saving time or board space or, I don't know, wear and tear on my writing hand. Um, the, the limit of the vector valued function r of t is equal to the vector l, uh, if and only if the limit as t goes to t naught of f1 of t equals l1 in this notation here, and the limit as t goes to t naught of f2 of t equals l2. Okay? All right. Ah, but wait, there's more. Um, we can do one more thing. Uh, another way of kind of rephrasing this theorem is, is to say the following. What we're really saying here is that the limit as t approaches t naught of r of t, which is f1 of t, f2 of t, right? Um, to take the limit of this vector-valued function, I can just take the limit component-wise, right? This is equal to the limit as t approaches t naught of f1 in the first component and the limit as t approaches t naught of f2 in the second component. Um, and, and we're going to find that this is a recurring theme for the calculus of vector-valued functions, that it's the same as the calculus of real valued functions, just everything that you do for a real valued function, you do it to each component of the vector valued function, right? We're gonna take limits component-wise, same is gonna be true for derivatives, same is gonna be true for integrals.